During my visit to the University of Minnesota PG and the program for an all-day talk, I sat down with the program director, Dr. Ronald Zapata, to talk about a few topics on microbiology and prognosis as it relates to endodontics. So, Dr. Zapata, thanks again for having me here. Uh, it's been a pleasure spending time with your residents. Uh, you know, a couple of questions that came up during the uh, talk um, about areas that you are obviously an expert on prognosis and prognostic factors, causes of failure, can you just kind of share with our audience a little on a quick side, what do you what do you think are the important prognostic factors? And in a case that has failed, where everything looks good, what are some of the factors that cause failure? Well, we have uh, multiple uh, ideologies for an endodontic failure, and this is something that um, the clinician needs to investigate uh, before addressing uh, the uh, persistence of apical periodontitis. Uh, most of the failures are connected to microbiology. So we have like persistence of biofilms, we can have extra radicular infection, uh, and we can have uh, secondary infections. It means that the root canal was contaminated during the treatment. But uh, what we have observed in our uh, published studies in the IEJ is that uh, most of the cases that are failing actually present microorganisms that we can find in the primary infection. So it's not really the theory of the effect is what we are seeing is mostly bacteria that was not removed and is persistent in the apical third. So we did an interesting study uh, in which uh, we took a sample from uh, root and resection surgeries. And we found that uh, the infection actually mimics the primary endodontic infection, if we take the sample from the apical third. And we did also a second study, it's a secondary uh, analysis, comparing samples that were taken in Spain and in the US, and they actually, they match the microbiology is very similar. It's all published in the in the IJA this year. It's going to be actually publishing on a special issue. And we have been doing, uh, also studies comparing uh, geographical differences because you know microorganisms can be probably different among populations right. so we did an um, interesting study that is probably is going to be submitted for publication in a few weeks comparing the microbiome of primary end infections uh, in the US and Sweden and we couldn't find any significant difference that's from the micro point of view of course we have as we were talking in the morning, you know, uh, immunosuppression. So patients are sometimes are not immunocompetent because they are taking systemic medications uh, to address like inflammatory disease, like bowel disease, Crohn disease. We have also rheumatoid arthritis. So those patients are mostly using long-term steroids right. that can affect also the healing. Um, we have also vertical refractors, you know, Vertical refractors and cracked teeth are, are, are kind of interesting because um, we are aging, you know, and the teeth are suffering or so forth, cyclic loading. So over the years, there is uh, this uh, accumulation of, the, of uh, stress on the tooth structure that can uh, initiate a crack and we will have crack variation over time. But those are the factors that are mostly related to failure and we are teaching the residents to just mostly uh, try to address this problem. So how? I mean, if we are having persistent infection, probably a uh, non-surgical treatment or a surgical treatment uh, could be the solution. Also, we have extra radicular infections, you know, apical cyst. If we have a, a cracked tooth that does not cause or a periodontal problem yet, so patient will need uh, some type of non-surgical recontrimin plus a full coverage restoration. So mm -hmm. we have all, all these factors that needs to be taken into consideration, yeah. Yeah, th th that is amazing. I mean, it goes back to what you were talking about in terms of precision medicine and the reality that, you yes. know, this is a multifactorial problem. Failure is a multifactorial problem. I agree. Understanding each factor and its contribution ultimately will be the, the goal of precision medicine, right? Which yes. in that individual with their own particular immune system, their own Agreed. particular histology and anatomy, yes. right? Correct. And then 
other para functions like you know somebody who's a grinder and has other kinds of issues and their own diet and all of these factors play they need to play you know access to care quality of care yes. all these things are all different factors that superimpose yes yeah, social economical factors so access to care is also important yeah exactly right and because the quality of the work that you do is going to be dependent on the quality of the restoration that comes after and therefore it's all it is, it, 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 it is interesting because especially in you know, certain cities in the U.S., um, getting access to uh, endowment streaming can be difficult. Uh, it can take weeks or months. So a case that's not present infection, at the, you know, when the patient seeks for the endodontist can be totally different when they get the appointment that is like three weeks, four weeks or six weeks later. Right. So access to care is, is, is really important as well. Yeah, no, you're right, because that, you know, the establishment of the biofilm, how long it's been there, Yes, it, it will make a huge difference in terms of how easy it is to eradicate. Prognosis. And right? So yes. access to care is a factor that plays into that. Plus, you know, costs that yes. is socioeconomically different people will have the more so they may ignore problems more readily than somebody else who has the ability to pay. So these are all really important factors that could change the outcome of the case. And I think that a lot of these go back to the socioeconomic uh, factors just as well as the technical and genetic factors. So it's a combination of things. It's it's a tough nut to crack, but <laughs> yes. yes, it's multifactorial. Yeah, but I mean, you guys are doing a great job here, taking a look at your clinic and all the stuff that you've done with your residents to at least locally here in Minneapolis to help address mm -hmm. some of these problems for the local population. I'm sure they um, they really benefit from it. Um, so let me just go back to the idea of the different species of bacteria, as yeah. you mentioned, because yeah. we know primary infections, secondary infections are generally based on previous literature has been yes. the fact that there's a difference as we move from a polymicrobial type of a, you know, anywhere from, yeah, from two to 40 different species of bacteria in the primary yeah. infections to the, to the secondary infections that are usually just, uh, you know, one or two or something like yes. that or less. Yes. Um, why would that be? So, I mean, what is, because you said your findings are kind of, yes, that, that the same species as well, as you said, across yes. population. There are like multiple variables. So we have moved from culture studies to next generation sequencing, <laughs> in which we can basically target all the bacterial species in a sample. But uh, taking the samples from the surgical sites, which is the apical third, also remove some bias because when you take samples through the crown, you're, all, you're not only taking samples from the apical third, but also from the coronal third. It's very, difficult to know, yeah. it's very difficult to know where the sample is coming from. When you take from the apical third, you get mostly proteolytic bacteria. It's bacteria that uses proteins as a source of energy. Mm -hmm. And those are mostly the same ones that can cause the primary endodontic infection, mostly Fusobacterium, Prebotella, and Porphyromone. It makes totally sense because bacteria need some form of energy to survive. And right. that's what they have in the apical mm -hmm. field. I don't know if you have observed probably of the Rangnaeri studies and Rikushi studies when uh, they present those pictures of the apical third that are contaminated. Those biofilms are polymicrobial. They don't look like a mono infection. You have right. like multiple type of morphotypes in the apical third. Yeah. So it is more polymicrobial than, than we previously think. stated. Then yes. it's not just a single, it's E. faecalis and it's because of the yes. protein pump. It's a more complicated, it's usually is the case. Yes. The research techniques for detection catch up a little bit later than the original theories. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, the field of the microbiome is moving really fast. And, right. and we are not talking also about the bacterial species, but also the function. Because we, I mean, this is the Cox postulate that you have a species and that bacterial species will cause a disease. But in biofield, we have multiple species that are sharing the same function. Mm. So if you remove one bacteria, another one will take the place of the, you know, of the bacteria that was removed. So the important here for bacteria, you know, from that point of view is to try to maintain the function. And the main function that we have in the recanal space is the proteolytic function. So bacteria is using multiple mechanisms to degrade the proteins that are in the area to get uh, the nutrients. Mm. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, it does make sense, right? I mean, historically, the idea of obturation was yeah. so that you could cut off the substrate yes. uh, capability of the bacteria. Mm -hmm. So where you end up seeing, even though you have good obturation, bacteria can survive, yes. they're clearly feeding off of something, and yeah. that something seems to be the proteins mm -hmm. inherent in the dental matrix. Yes. So they it, don't need that substrate at the same rate. Yes, it, it's interesting because um, when you, when we compare well, no, you check the articles that compare the microbiome in saliva, in the subgingival plug, supergingival plug in the tongue. Uh, we have observed that the like the microbiome in periodontal cysts is very similar to the microbiome in the root canal space. And what these two diseases have in common is inflammation. Right. And then it is the inflammatory exudate that is producing uh, the nutrients for the bacteria that is selecting the microbiome actually. So even if you inoculate bacteria from the supergingival plaque, mm -hmm. the root canal environment and the nutrients that are present are going to basically eradicate the bacteria that cannot use proteins and all the bacteria that can use the substratum that is present in the root canal space, which is the necrotic pole, will populate the environment, right. and dominate. Yeah, it's a selective the, pressure. It's a selective pressure, yes. Basically, it's just and basically that's what is happening in, uh, in endodontic failures. So if huh. we are finding this type of proteolytic bacteria, it means that there is uh, probably necrotic tissue or access of the bacteria to the um, inflammatory exudate. Which is common in the apical there, you know, the complex anatomy, multiple, you know, uh, framing, apical deltas, or right. they have some type of inflammation, yes, in that area. Uh, that is true. I mean, you know, dead tissue or even uh, remaining biofilm, even if the biofilm is um, kind of dead to these bacteria, it mm -hmm. is now a source of food, right? Yes, yes. They'll just use the previously existing biofilm to establish their own colonies. And that is another, you know, <laughs> Uh, question. So it's important to have important question, even if you have an approximate answer. Right. So the opposite, it, it doesn't work. I mean, your question is not good, even if you have the exact answer. The important part is the question is like, some bacteria may survive. What about if the bacteria cannot survive, but they are not proteolytic? Right. They probably won't cause a lot of damage because there is not enough nutrients for them to proliferate. So yeah, that's why that's, probably... Yeah, that's a very interesting. That's, yeah. that's a new path that I think sounds to be promising, at least it's logical, it does make sense. Uh, let me ask you a question. So we know yeah. that about, uh, so in the oral cavity, we have about, what, 773 different species of bacteria. Yeah. I've been isolated so far. In the endodontic infections, we've found about about 100. Which yeah, is like it's around? 30 or 40 species per sample. Per sample. Per sample. But I mean, overall, the numbers oh, yeah. that's around 100 species yeah. have been associated with endodontic infections, yes. right? Yes. That are pathogenic or opportunistic pathogens yes. or things like that mm -hmm. in that case. Do we have an idea as to which ones of them have proteolytic capabilities? Yes. Yes. So we, what what percentage do you think that would we be? Know, we, know, we know really well um, the bacteria that there are, those are Pretty also asacrolytic. Asacrolytic ones are... Those are the okay. same ones that cause periodontal disease. Yes, yeah, so they're from Sokransky, Sokransky, yeah. Sokransky, Orange, Red Complex, yeah, yeah, yeah. Orange Complex. Those are basically the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They use the same type of nutrients, inflammatory exudate. That's and, interesting. And necrotic tissue. Yes. Oh. That's why we don't have like streptococcal mutants or lactobacillus. They cannot survive in the root canal environment because there is not the right food for those bacteria. That's interesting. You know, that's funny because, I mean, those red complex uh, bacteria is also found in Alzheimer's disease. And that's the alpha, alpha, you know, amylase kind of a, a protein disease. I wonder if that has any kind of a connection with the yes, proteolytic component. You know, uh, Porphyromona gingivalis, we have Porphyromona endodontalis, yeah. they are called keystone pathogens because they can manipulate the, the manipulate the inflammatory or the inflammation, the inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. So they are uh, smart enough to produce inflammation, to get nutrients, but not to destroy so much to get <laughs> uh, targeted by the immune system. So Sorry. those are like keystone, keystone species. Yes, that's why probably there is this chronic nature of apical periodontitis. Right. And there is actually the, a group from Spain, from University of Granada, they, they have published that and they did sequencing of the uh, apical granuloma and they found porphyromona Porphyromonas as the main species. And I mean, there's always, you know, these 
risk of contamination. Okay, but what are your contaminants in a surgical field? Well, saliva doesn't have porphyromonas in high percentages. Plaque, supergingival plaque, not a lot. You may have a subgingival plaque, but it's very difficult to contaminate an apical granuloma with subgingival plaque. So I'm very suspicious that some of these microorganisms can colonize, you know, the last apical millimeters of the uh, root canal space and try to induce some chronic inflammation, but at the same time, it's not so destructive so they don't get, you know, yeah, yeah, cleared yeah. by the immune well, system. Yeah. I mean, it's very possible, as you said, as you know, over time, these opportunistic infections have found how to become commensal yes. so that they could survive and survive. not be, uh, you know, and it's interesting because I've noticed clinically that a lot Sometimes these patients that have lesions that are asymptomatic, they become symptomatic following a systemic immune uh, problem, such as yes. a cold, a viral cold. Yes. And uh, my theory was that, well, nothing has changed about the tooth. This yeah. probably would mean that by you, you're raising the threshold of the immune system, yes. or rather lowering it lowering. in a sense, yes. so that now you're having an overreaction because you've kind of you know, prime the immune system overall for the virus. Mm -hmm. And now it's noticing what it had previously created a truth with, mm -hmm. that it wasn't gonna attack this area. Yeah. And now it's gonna attack it. And that's why you end up getting the pus and swelling in the acid formation. Yes, it's very interesting because we know that bacteria causes apical right. inflammation, pulp necrosis, apical periodontitis is, is like a black or white. You know, by Kakehashi, it's, right, so. you know, it's a classic study. But we don't really know how we progress from apical periodontitis to an acute apical abscess. Right. You know, this is the link that we don't have a lot of data. I mean, we know by basic science how an abscess will. Right. But we don't know if it's the increased aggressiveness of right. bacteria or is a new problem. Yeah. You yeah, know, who triggers it? Is it the bacteria that starts the war? Who throws the yeah, first? What is the immune right. system? That the was, first missile? Is it the bacteria or is it the uh, the uh, the immune system? Or a combination? Yes. Or a combination. We we have some you know some preliminary data uh, comparing like large apical lesions and small apical lesions because it's very difficult to investigate these in patients because there is a timeline and you cannot take samples over time without treating the patient. Well, uh, right. They need to get definitive treatment, but we have found that similar to periodontal disease, that bacteria with motility starts to uh, increase their abundance in large lesions. So what are the bacteria with motility, like triponemas, uh, some uh, selenomonas, and that is a sign that um, the bacteria is just trying to mostly invade because those bacteria, they have like um, invasion capabilities because of the motility. Yeah. Wow, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, this is a mm -hmm. fascinating area of research, and I'm sure people like yourself and many of the people that are working on the immuno you know immunology and microbiology uh, area can obviously in the future shed some light in this topic. Yes. So terrific. So I mean, this was great. Thanks so much for sitting yeah. down with me and having this Thank conversation. You. Maybe doing some more videos and so on with you on this topic. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Terrific. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah.